Um, uh, welcome everybody and welcome to the panel. I'll invite my guests to just come and take their seats and then I will introduce them. We are going to have a short-ish uh, conversation about progressive down. So just a tiny bit. I've worked in fashion for four decades now. And when I first began, for me, it was very important to challenge the unachievable body ideals that I saw uh, in our magazines and to uh, actually reach out to the consumer. I've been asked to talk a little bit about what I think is inclusive design. And uh, for me, it's dictated by those of us who wear clothes. Uh, the end user is not just the catwalk model, or not even the catwalk model. Actually, we're a beautiful, diverse group of human beings, and we all understand the power of clothing to create uh, our own narrative for people to read. And I've worked with many people whose sense of self and identity has been transformed by great design or great styling or just an understanding of what to pick for themselves. And uh, to a certain extent, the fashion industry has lagged behind in offering a much more knowledgeable offer uh, or range of clothes that are adaptable, that recognize uh, needs, a variety of needs, uh, and that answer uh, gaps in the market. So I'm thrilled to be able to introduce my experts. On my right, I have Jamie Gill. He's chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee and executive board member at the British Fashion Council. Also executive director at luxury brand Roxander and founder of the Outsiders Perspective, which we'll get him to talk a little bit more about. Uh, next, I have Millie flamington Clare. She is founder of Human Beauty, an inclusive makeup brand with advocacy and community at its core that champions disability-friendly makeup and features genuine representation. And that brings me to Samantha Bullock, who uh, is co-owner of London Represents and the powerhouse behind tonight's event, and she has worked tirelessly to spread the narrative of inclusive design. She's founder of the SB Shop. She's an award winner for the Power 100's most influential disabled people in the UK. She's a diversity and inclusion activist, a wheelchair model, and a public speaker. And finally, I have Gemma Garner at the end there, who is business. Yes, go on then, if you'd like to, just go ahead. Thank you, Samantha, for all that you do. Uh, and finally, I have Gemma Garner, business developer and initiative project owner for inclusive uh, assortment at one of Europe's leading fashion companies, Zalando. So now I'm going to ask you to do a big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. I'm going to make my first question, also going to have a seat, uh, and I will come to Jamie and Samantha for that. So design can impact everyone's life, that much we know. What does it mean to design inclusively? Jamie, you're right by me, you first. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Hold it away. Um, firstly, I just want to kick off by saying I think uh, the show's been fantastic so far. As, as chair of the DNI committee at the BFC, that's the first truly inclusive uh, runway show I've ever seen. So well done to Samantha and the team here for pulling that off. So a real celebration. Really, really, really moved and, and you know, something we should all be proud of. And thank you all for being here to support the cause and, and, uh, and you know, instill and uh, help change, positive change, so fantastic. Um, right, in answer to your question, I think um, I'm an architect by training, so design's in my, uh, design's in my DNA, but it's, it's, so, it's so 
intrinsic. It's so it has such a um, powerful um, uh, position in society to really, really help uh, mold our lives. Um, what, one example I always reference is um, some of you might be familiar with is um, the Maggie Centers, which uh, a number of leading star architects um, design cancer um, rehabilitation centers and the proof and the evidence that we have of how um, how design can fundamentally heal people. And I think, you know, that's one point that I think sits as the umbrella of the overarching point of how impactful design can be. Um, and, you know, we live with it and we touch it, you know, every day. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot more uh, that, that can be done fundamentally. And this is why we're having this conversation now, because it has it, it design sits so close with uh, society and can uh, really really drive change, but we need to be the pioneers of moving that conversation forward because as we can see right now, um, it, particularly in fashion, we're not being reflective enough of our consumer. Um, and, um, and yeah, yeah, and I, I, and I think conversations like this is, is what is really important to, to really begin escalating that movement. Thank you, Jamie. And over to you, Samantha. You know, we're looking to design inclusive but of course, a key thing is having people at the table with the knowledge of what is needed for different groups of consumers. Yeah, so I thought about how to start this panel and I want to throw some numbers at you. Yeah, so we have 1.2 billion people in the world that are disabled. We have a economic power of $3 trillion dollars if you think only about the person with disability, and this can be $8 trillion if you consider friends, family, and their circle. And also, we need to think that um, the fashion industry here in UK lost two billion pounds per month to not be inclusive. So we have the permanent disabilities, but we also have temporary disabilities. As you know, you can have an accent, you can break your leg or anything. But another main factor is we are all aging. And with that, we are going to get some kind of challenge in front of us. But um, I want to start in 2006 when I convinced a friend of mine to convince his friend that to put me in the catwalk, even that there was a steps, wasn't a bad was the, the, that this was the best thing that they had even think about. So um, at that point, was the number one uh, tennis player, wheelchair tennis player in Brazil. So they put me in the cat. I hold the models. Uh, they put me down the two steps. I went the catwalk and then I opened the Brazilian flag. So if you didn't realize I'm this beautiful accent, if you didn't realize that. And uh, so the thing was perfect. This was 2006, 17 years ago, when we didn't think about disabled people. It was hard for us even to get out of the house, much more to be in, in the road. But one thing wasn't right. The clothes weren't made for, made for me. So I'm for 36 years now, model, a professional model, and when at my age, when I was 14 years old, when I had my accident, I realized that the clothes weren't made for me. At that point, I thought, this is my mission. I'm going to change that. So because of that, we launched the SCB shop that's inclusive um, startup where we collaborate with brands and you design inclusive products. So this... Why you didn't make that our own, own production? Because it was to put the seed in each brand's heart where they could produce only two to 5% of their collections and there this way make the things universal. Because we know that towards disability is very hard. The disabilities, they are very peculiar. They have different disabilities. It's not one fits all. So it's very difficult when you talk about how to design inclusively, you know, because it doesn't have one solution. It's not I'm going to use a zipper, I'm going to use Velcro, I'm going to, it doesn't have that. We need to have a variety, variety of uh, different solutions and uh, with different clothes from dresses, from uh, trousers, to jackets, to bags, to everything. 
to, to, to cater for, for our needs. So this is why we launched the SB shop and everything that we do, we focus on this inclusion and we try to make it this universal. Because to make a bespoke in piece is going to be pricing, but also it's going to take much longer. So disability is not one fits all, you know, but it's for everyone. Thank you, Samantha. I'm going to bring in Millie now to ask you uh, what adaptive fashion uh, um, beauty, how would you describe your journey in designing for body and appearance difference? Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so adaptive beauty is uh, beauty products designed with everyone in mind and making beauty products easy to use, which you would, as an everyday consumer, you might think, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. Um, in terms of my journey, uh, I was born with a rare genetic disorder, only affecting 3,000 people in the world. But I've used makeup as a form of therapy. During times of bad health, I've been in hospital, and that little bit of mascara is, I believe, uh, a major part in people's healing journeys. Um, but I became really frustrated by the lack of representation in the beauty industry. You know, one in four people in the UK have a disability, but when do you ever see people represented properly? Um, so that's what made me decide to create my brand, Human Beauty. It's all about embracing what makes us unique, not just for disabled people, but really truly representing society as, as a whole and spreading the message that perfect is boring and human is beautiful. You know, this thing that we're always bombarded with within the fashion and beauty industry. Um, so that was kind of my goal and to make cosmetics truly accessible for everyone. Thank you, Millie, and such an, yes. such an important point you make about the healing power of image. Actually being able to, in, to enjoy, feel enjoyment about uh, seeing ourselves uh, and controlling our image to a certain extent. Yeah, I, I always say that like it, the kind of the power of makeup is, is truly, you know, you go back to kind of, war times and concentration camps and people were making lipsticks because it brings people together um, and the fact that I always say the fact that the lack of representation but you think about it someone could go blind tomorrow but because they can't see doesn't mean they're not a makeup lover anymore mm. um, and it yeah it needs to change. Thank you. Gemma, I'm going to bring you in on that as well. Did, um, describe your journey for us in terms of um, the way you work to bring in diversity and inclusion. Yeah, but I, I want to say, first of all, I've, I've been focusing on adaptive fashion for the last few years, and I've never been in a space where so many brands at, at one time have shown an adaptive collection or considered adaptive fashion in the way that we've seen it tonight. So for me personally where I am on my journey, this is an extremely exciting evening. And, um, and I just can't wait to see more and more of this as, as this conversation grows. But um, what is adaptive fashion um, in terms of um, clothing and textiles and footwear? So, and I feel like I'm preaching to the wrong crowd a bit because we have seen so much adaptive fashion. But for anyone that doesn't know, it's, it's clothing or footwear that is designed specifically with a disabled person in mind, with a disability in mind, to make getting dressed easier. Something that is extremely easy for most of us, but not for everyone. So where, um, where Zalando is, or where Zalando has been on the journey is um, very, very different from an organizational point of view. So Zalando is a, is, a, is, a, is a platform, is a retailer offering fashion and beauty in 25 markets worldwide with uh, 50 million active customers. So a, an opportunity and perhaps a responsibility for platforms is to really um, understand a huge customer base that is grossly underrepresented currently. Um, so with so many active customers, where, that's where we start. We start with the customer. What is the customer looking for? What are the needs of the customer? So we start with as much uh, market research, consumer insights, interviews, focus groups, as much as possible so that we can start to understand what it is that we've been underserving. So this led us very, very quickly to realize that we can't design for the disabled community without the disabled community. So very early, we uh, collaborated with an agency called All Is For All. Everyone at this agency is self-identifying as uh, disabled. So 
What this meant for Zalando was that we could really understand what do we need to do internally to be able to, to better serve this customer. So it was really uh, at least a year of um, upskilling, of training uh, staff. Um, we have six and a half thousand brands that we offer at Zalando, and some of these are private label brands as well. So it's, it's training our designers, our product developers, what features do you need to consider? How do you need to redesign garments so that it, people can get dressed easier and, and put these clothes on themselves easier? Um, how can we upskill our content marketing team so that they can drive relevant and authentic experiences in the customer journey? Um, how can we train even, sounds really simple, but how can we train our partner-facing employees to feel comfortable with talking about disabled people and disabilities, which is really important so that they can spread this message? Gemma, thank you. I'm actually going to um, ask for a little bit of, oh, and an applause, marvelous. Um, but a little bit of quiet at the, the back there. I'm just gonna get you very quickly. We've got a magic trick here. Gemma doesn't know I'm going to ask her this. Um, but uh, we talked about adaptive design as if it's necessarily for people out there. And actually, even if we are able-bodied, we benefit from uh, smooth fastenings, things that are easy to do up, uh, and shoes that are easy to put on. You're gonna regret showing me, but uh, Gemma's wearing a pair of trainers that you can actually put on without using your hands. I'm gonna have so to I'm just gonna it. ask you to stand up and take your trainer off. Oh my God, and, it's my moment. <laughs> and just show it. Um, that, hand your microphone over. Hands free, I'll talk you through it. The foot at the back pulls it up. The shoe collapses into two pieces, but the inside of the shoe remains whole. Such a great idea. Who, what's not to like? I'm going to come now back to Samantha. How can a brand represent um, communities with body difference or disability authentically? So I'm going to tell you another story. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I went for a holiday with my family. And there we have been uh, following up. Someone was following us all the time. And we would wake, go to the breakfast, they are there. We would go to the pool, they are there. We would go to the beach, they were there. We would go to hiking, they are there. We would go to the city center, they were there. And um, so when we are checking out in the last day, so this family, so you heard right, was a family that has been behind of us all the time. They came and apologetically said, sorry, I have been following you all the way through. Because I have a daughter that she's a three years old and uh, I, don't know, I don't know how it's going to be her future. So I have been following you to see, and we are very impressed that you have your family, that you do the things, that you go to the beach, that you do everything. So I was 17 years old, so we are talking about like 30 years ago. Her name is uh, Isabel, Belly. She just passed away a few months ago. This makes me very emotional. She was a very good friend of mine. And um, she was doing the inclusive fashion for the government of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So let's say we have an inclusive fashion program from the government in Brazil. So this is, is amazing for us Brazilians to say. And um, so basically we became friends. Uh, at that time, you know, 30 years ago, um, 30, no, like 25 years ago, Instagram, Facebook, so it was hard for, for us to see people like us, to see representation. So I think this is the response. I want to tell this story to you because I want to, uh, everyone to relate. It's like, this is the importance to representation, is to see people like us, for us to see ourselves there. So moms and everyone doesn't need to pass through that, you know. And uh, as you have the, the good bags, I just want to, this, was a eight years old that asked me, what can you do now that you couldn't do before? And this tricked my mind because it was like, every time that I would give a talk, I would think about the things I couldn't do. 
and he made me think the things about what I can do. And this is not because I'm disabled. This is about everyone here. What can we do now that we couldn't do before for our lives, for everything? So we need to think about diversity in the positive way. So it's, I think this is why representation is so important. I think also, um, and I'm going to ask the panel uh, for a free fall on this one, we talk about representation in front of the lens, but we also need representation and inclusion behind the lens, in the teams, uh, in leadership, in the decision-making and the voices that contribute. Um, perhaps if I could um, come to you, Jamie, for a comment on that and uh, go down the line, what your thinking is on that? Yes, I, I think, look, um as an industry, I think the public would uh, perceive fashion and luxury to be a lot more inclusive than it is for the very reason that ad campaigns, runway shows, you know, events create, a t create that attempt at an inclus inclusive appearance. And I think that somewhat fools, fools the public and, and, and thinks uh, things are a lot more further on than they are. Whilst all of that is completely positive, when we look operationally, we look at C-suite, we look at who's driving, who's, who's behind the business of fashion, um, it's, 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 really, it's, it's really the same. Uh, and and we're, still, we're still not where we should be at all. You know, we're still white middle class, middle aged man is, you know, still the CEO of most fashion and luxury brands. And we haven't reached gender diversity yet within fashion and luxury. We have minimal under 6% representation of ethnic diversity within operational roles within fashion and luxury. And then disability lags even further behind. You know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, as uh, Millie mentioned, one in, one in four or one in five uh, people are disabled, yet that representation is, is minimal when it comes to the business of fashion. Um, and, and, and that's where real change, you know, is really, is really needed. Um, some of the work I do, I, I run a not-for-profit where we bring particularly people of color into operational roles in fashion and luxury. And it's where, um, it's where I think um, is an area we really need to focus on to really drive change. Because you've got to bring the people in to make a difference to then um, uh, bring, bring more and more people in uh, to um, go up the ranks and ultimately reach this leadership position to really create an inclusive workforce because we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, and I also think in terms of designing products, you, you wouldn't believe the amount of like accessible products that haven't actually been run past the people that they're made for. Um, and it seems uh, an, a, a given, but designing products and actually going out and consumer testing with people who have reduced mobility or who are visually impaired and blind, um, that's like a massive part of being an accessible, uh, inclusive brand. Thank you. And Gemma, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, maybe a slightly different angle in terms of representation. I think, from my experience, anyone that finds joy in fashion wants to see themselves reflected in it. And I think, maybe as I can give an example, I think if, if anyone tries to think of the last time that you saw a person with disabilities or a visible impairment, someone in a wheelchair, when you were in stores or when you were online scrolling through you know, the customer experience, when you were looking through the style advice section in a magazine, when's the last time that you saw the disabled community reflected in that? And I think it's very, very easy to say that it's, it's very rare, rare. So I think this is, um, this is an area that is, is totally lacking in terms of representation, not just for the disabled community, but for many underserved, underrepresented communities. So an obvious question to follow on is how do we pressure the fashion industry to broaden their representation? And of course, we can point to individual designers uh, who have made a stand. We can certainly look at people like Alexander McQueen, who many, many years ago worked with double amputee, uh, Amy McWilliams, I think it was. Um, but so there are... Um, individual statements but as a whole moving along as an industry um i think millie this question's got your name on it how do we challenge the fashion industry to uh take a stronger stand than it currently is yeah i think it's really important to challenge beauty standards or beauty norms because you know we're we're pushed this by the fashion beauty industry but also the wider media um I, for example, I've just launched my first 
makeup therapy campaign. And it's not just a disabled beauty brand, it's a brand for everyone. So our youngest um, model was 19, our oldest was 73. Uh, we had people of all abilities. We had a girl wearing a hijab because actually true like representation and challenging the status quo of uh, beauty standards is having, you know, a, a, a societal view uh, in advertising, in marketing, in kind of developing products. And I think it's all about shouting the loudest because realistically, if people aren't standing up to these people, they're going to they're gonna keep doing it. Um, and it's also calling out tokenistic inclusivity because it's very easy for massive brands to be like, oh, consumers now want inclusivity. But I think it's pretty loud when it is tokenistic because I always say, like, with beauty, which is way behind in the fashion industry in all kinds, but especially disability, um, having a few different skin tones in a beauty campaign that all still look like supermodels is not inclusivity um, or you know representative so it uh, it's about being loud and talking about it and challenging these brands and also kind of just sh sharing the story and we also know that when brands engage in a broader appeal it does reflect back on their quarterly turns we returns we can look at dove and see how they began the conversation about broadening the age range, uh, different skin tones, different body shapes, and their sales soared. Jamie, do you think that that is a key to incentivizing perhaps jaded CEOs into approaching this differently? Um, I think, look, in, in my professional career, this is fundamentally what I'm lobbying as, as much as possible to get as many fashion and luxury brands to be as inclusive, inclusive as possible, you know, across the spectrum. And, um, and particularly on the, the, the business of fashion, as I mentioned, is where I kind of sit in terms of that need for leadership representation and, and real, real change here. And I think there, there's, there's um, uh, I always fall back on uh, the business case for diversity. And I think, you know, that's where I've had the most success when you've got engagement with brands and businesses who understand that, uh, the market for them is fundamentally female. You know, 75% to begin here, you know, is um, uh, a female consumer for fashion and luxury globally. Um, and where is, their, where is that consumer base? You know, completely internationally, all over the world and from all different cultures and walks of life. And then referencing Millie's statistic as well, then one in, one in four people of those are disabled as well. And then none of that is then reflective really operationally because we haven't seen any of that balance yet. We are not at a gender diversity at C-suite in fashion and luxury, let alone, as I mentioned, ethnic diversity or let alone disability. So that's the bit where I always hone in on that you're missing a commercial trick here because you're not selling or feeding to your consumer. You're not, it's not reflective. Your team is not reflective. So how can you scale your business? We have data that shows how gender balanced businesses and ethnically diverse businesses and business with um, a strong disability at leadership level are financially more profitable than those that are not. But, I, but what I wanted to say here was, sometimes I'm still fighting a losing battle. You know, with C-suite, they still are not convinced that they really need to change here, that they really need to be fully inclusive in their marketing, in their outward approach, let alone internally reflective of their workforce. And I think what needs to change is fashion has such an in, fashion and beauty has such an intrinsic link with society, with you, with people. And I think my ask really is to everybody to start really singing from the same hymn sheet and, and demanding this and asking for this, like wanting to see people like ourselves reflected in the brands that we're buying from both visually, but also behind closed doors, you know, behind the people who are designing and creating and building and driving and growing business out there that we want to, you know, spend our hard earned money, net money after tax into that is that reflective of us? Because right now it really isn't. And, you know, we, we have a choice of where we put our money. And I think my ask therefore is, is it's half working with this, with my lobbying case with, with um, C-suite, but to, to everybody here to really start shouting for this and demanding this and, and using our platforms, using show, social media as, a, as a mechanism to be like, I'm not buying from you if your team doesn't rep represent me or if your campaign can't represent me. Really good point. And also, yes, thank you. I think so. <laughs> I, 
I think the space we have as individuals to push the agendas that we feel strongly about uh, is not to be underestimated. We're not mindless con uh, consumers. We are citizen participants, yeah. and we do have active power. Uh, that, for instance, everybody in this room tonight, if you were to Instagram some a range of the diverse images that you have seen on the catwalk, with perhaps some of the comments that our experts have given you to to think on, you would be educating your community who may not have thought about this in the same way. I'm going to come to you, Gemma. Uh, uh, Jamie gave a whole host of incentives, really, for encouraging other brands to perhaps think a little bit more um, uh, incisively about the area of the market that they're not yet serving um, and how their, their business can become more inclusive. What uh, does Zalanda, um, what, what are the, is the motivation that Zalanda kind of takes forward in order to become uh, more inclusive, more sustainable? How do, what do your board meetings look like where you're going, I want this in our marketing. We haven't got enough representation. Look, the most important thing is uh, what is the right thing to do for the customer that you are serving um, there, is, there is the chance to offer a remarkable experience for the customers that are coming to you to make that experience even better. And you know what? There is usually, as Jamie said, a very good commercial opportunity that comes with this. So I think when, when you marry the two and you can, you can really build a case for this, then this is really what drives innovation and drives businesses forward. Thank you. Um, Samantha, by way of just reflection... You are possibly responsible for creating the most diverse fashion imagery that we will see, um, again, as, as Jamie pointed out, during British Fashion Week. What is it, in, in terms of coming this far, what is there left for you to achieve? What do you want? What's your next stepping stone? I think what you want is for you guys to have fun, to enjoy, you know, um, to learn and to take inclusion inside of your heart. Because if you, I, I, it's, it's like I'm doing social media and everything, so it's, it's easy for us to go there and say, and everyone is going to say, oh, blah, 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 you know. But if you are feeling, if you had this feeling, if you understood from, from your heart that life is for all, that we are here to make a change, that fashion is here to serve as a toll for us to live a better world, this is, is, is the aim of the London Represents, is to bring the, the, the best that we have as a community and live a legacy. And I just hope that more and more people engage in, uh, in what we are doing. Thank you, Samantha. We're going to wrap it up now because we have uh, another section of the show to, uh, uh, to air. I'm just going to ask each of our experts to perhaps give one final tip on the what key actions can brands take right now to improve, improve their inclusivity. Is there one thing that occurs? Um, Millie, would you like to start with that? Um, I think... <coughs> I think brands should just start asking people uh, is the first step and start kind of showing more true representation. Um, but also, I'm just going to do a shameless plug. So I'm Human Beauty London, LDN on Instagram. So go follow us. And yeah, we've got lots of big things to come. Nice bit of marketing. Gemma, do you want a quick one? You know what, I think, um, I think people, brands, designers are scared of doing it wrong. And um, if I think back to the journey, I think yeah, we've launched collections, we're working with pioneers like Tommy who have been doing this since 2017, offering adaptive collections. And I think every day we're thinking, are we getting this wrong? Are we, are we doing something perfect? You need to do something. I think that what you can do that is wrong is to do nothing at all. So I think this is the starting point. And also another shameless plug, because the booth in the corner could be a starting point for brands, because here we have collections showing features and how um, garments are adapted 
to, to suit um, disabled people. Thank you. Jamie, a quick one from you. Um, I would say what, what the fundamental that brands should be doing and businesses out there is, is begin with your data, understand who your customer is, look at who's buying your clothes and really, and really cut that data because, and then reflect on who is your internal team and what is your marketing and messaging because I guarantee you it won't be reflective of who, you, of who your consumer is. And Sam, final word for you. I'm just going to say that for the brands, the phrase of the day what can you do today that you couldn't do before? So just do, you know, start being inclusive. This is the right path. <laughs> Thank you very much. Huge round of applause, please, for Gemma, Sam, Millie, and Jamie. Congratulations. Thank you for a great chat. And enjoy the rest of the show. We will take the stage. <laughs>